Hi, this is Office Hours from Duke University. This week we're with Vanessa Woods, who's a primate researcher in the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology. She studies the great apes, and she's also an author and journalist. Her latest book coming out next week is called Bonobo Handshake, and it's a combination memoir and call to action. Vanessa and her husband, Brian Hare, an associate professor of evolutionary anthropology at Duke, have been performing problem-solving experiments with bonobos to understand how these closely related species are like us and how they're different. She's here to talk about all of that and more and to answer your questions. To submit your questions, please send an email to live at duke.edu. You may tweet us with the hashtag DukeLive, all one word, or you can post a comment to the Duke University Facebook page under today's office hours item. So let's meet Vanessa Woods. Vanessa Woods is a research scientist in the Hominoid Psychology Group at Duke. She's also the author of three children's books, Popularizing Science, and her journalism has appeared on the Disney Channel and the Discovery Channel. A portion of the profits from Bonobo Handshake will go to Friends of Bonobos to support the Lolo Ya Bonobo Sanctuary in Congo. I'm Carl Bates with the Duke News Office, and we're here with Vanessa Woods for Office Hours. Welcome. Hi, Carl. Thank you. Uh, so let's just start with the easy question. What is a bonobo? So a bonobo are our closest living relatives. They're related to us by, they share 98.7% of our DNA. But we actually just did a study at Duke and apparently only 25% of people have ever heard of them. So they're extremely rare. They only live in one country, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they share many traits with chimpanzees. So when people see a photograph of bonobos or when they historically saw them in the wild, they probably just thought that they were another chimpanzee. And um, they look very similar, but the main differences are that bonobos have these really cute part in the middle of their head. Um, for some reason, their heart, hair just parts directly down the center. And they have um, these really red lips, so they have pigmented pink lips just like us. And they tend to be more gracile than chimpanzees, which means their limbs are a lot more slender. Hmm. But um, the thing that we're most interested in is, is what is inside their mind. So bonobos have a very different psychology to chimpanzees. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, there's this interesting duality where the bonobos represent one half of us and the chimps represent the other. We'll come back to that. Tell us a bit about uh, where your work occurs, the Loloya Bonobo Sanctuary. So we work in Congo and we work at the world only bonobo sanctuary. They have something like 60 orphans there. So it's also the world's largest captive population. It's more than any zoo or center in the world. And it's just outside the capital city and it's just absolutely beautiful. I'd like you to read a short passage, in fact, from the book. Sure. It's a description of you after a hair-raising ride to get to Lola. Yeah, out of the airport. And, Fun. and you <laughs> jump out of the vehicle, and this is what you see. Nous sommes arrivés. Papa Sedico announces it cheerily as the car rolls to a standstill. I jump out of the deathmobile as fast and far as my trembling legs will take me. I look around, and the first surprise is the forest. Besides mango trees, we've barely seen a single tree since we arrived in Kinshasa. The sanctuary is covered in them. There's feathered palm trees and wide leaf umbrella trees, trees with weird curling seed pods. In the distance, a giant forest with languid vines and flocks of birds stretches as far as the horizon. The sanctuary is built on a hill that slopes towards a large lake. Tall red flowers bloom around its edges. Water lilies float on the surface. Below us, the river snakes over small rapids. Above us, the stone path leads to several colonial houses. It is more a resort than an orphanage for the world's most endangered ape. That sounds absolutely wonderful. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So what is this place? This is the last forest in Kinshasa, basically. Um, Kinshasa, just like most metropolitan cities, has been completely raised, and there's very, it's very rare to see a tree that isn't used for some kind of fruit. And this forest was the weekend villa of um, the last dictator of Congo, whose name was Mbutu Sisiseko. And he used to go there on weekends to just kind of get out of the heat and dust of the city. So this is his personal compound. This is his personal retreat. Nice. Um, and how did it come into the hands of Lola? You know? Well, when Mobutu was toppled, um, you know, Kinshasa was just a total shambles and the directress of the of the sanctuary, Claudine Andre, she was looking for a place to um, to house all these orphan bonobos that had come into her care. And there was, uh, she was at a, another sort of very tiny forest in the middle of Kinshasa, but you know, she saw Lola and it was just so beautiful. 
and she had to raise something like $200,000 in a year. And this was a time when nobody had any money. So it was, I think, mostly an anonymous donor who gave them the funds for it. And then so she moved all her bonobos there and that was Lola. Why are these animals orphaned? Well, their parents uh, get killed. Basically, the bushmeat trade is roaring in Congo. So in Cong Congo, some of the tribes actually eat more meat than the French. So, you know, every year they're eating protein worth three times the size of the Empire State Building. And there's no real agriculture in Congo, which means that to get their protein, they usually go out and shoot it. And apes are really good. Um, they're sort of like a, a high value meat for hunters because if you found, they live in communities. So if you find one bonobo, you've probably found 30 that you can like shoot at the same time. They have a lot of meat. You only need, you know, one bullet. So this is their, their high value and a lot of them get killed. And the orphans who survive have witnessed some pretty horrific yep, things. That's right. Well, they've just seen their mothers and their entire communities killed. And we know they have memories, we know they have emotions. And so some of these orphans that arrive at the sanctuary, um, because once they get confiscated and, you know, some of the hunters, they get caught selling their meat at the market and then they don't bother killing the babies because they don't have enough meat on them. So they try and sell these little babies to pets. And some of them have actually um, been caught on their way to Europe and, the, and Russia, basically. So some of these bonobos, they're getting out. But mostly they just sort of end up in people's homes, like in villages or around Kinshasa. So they're, they're physically damaged and probably emotionally as well. Yeah, that's right. In Congo, there's, um, they also use their digits for witchcraft because bonobos look so similar to human, then there's a lot of superstitious beliefs that, you know, a, a baby a baby finger, you know, if you cook it in soup, it will sort of make the mother, a pregnant mother strong and, um, yeah, all this kind of nasty stuff which doesn't really help their survival. Hmm. Um, let's spend a little more time on nasty stuff and then we'll get back to the bonobos. Tell us just a bit about the backdrop of Congo. I found parts of the book fascinating. You talk about there, there are actually two countries now. We just usually say the Congo. Um, and it relates to the animals as well. There's chimpanzee Congo and bonobo Congo. Can you just walk us through that quickly? Sure, so Congo got split a long time ago. The Belgian sort of uh, King Leopold sent uh, Stanley to sort of gazette this huge area for him, basically for the rubber trees. And at the same time, the French were like running around the other side of the Congo River basically, and they didn't get such a big chunk. So Chimpanzee Congo is a very small colony that used to be run by the French. It's called the People's Republic of Congo. And the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was the other ones that the Belgians got, that has chimpanzees, but bonobos only live in one. So I was like always confused. I'm like, oh, how can there be two Congos? And so I just sort of simplified it for myself and I called the big Congo, the Belgian Congo, Bonobo Congo, because bonobos were only in that country. But chimpanzee Congo, I called the other side, because also that's where we work with a chimpanzee sanctuary over there. Now, Brian has a, a hypothesis about why bonobos and the chimps are different about sharing and food and behavior. And it has to do with this geography, where they started from. Yep, that's right. So chimpanzees live in, um, in an area that meat is kind of this highly prized food and also the fruiting trees, there's a lot of competition when they feed. So it's kind of like chimpanzees live in an Easter egg patch where there's only like kind of a few high value yummy chocolate eggs and you know you've been to an Easter egg hunt where there isn't quite enough and children kind of descend into these little feral things that are running around prepared to kill each other. And so bonobos, they live kind of more in a chocolate factory. So they survive on this herbaceous root and there's just so much of it. There's so much of it around and so they're kind of like, a lot more laid back and this is sort of transferred onto their temperament because we see that there's a lot more competition with chimpanzees, they, they're emo emotionally, they're a lot more driven whereas bonobos, they're kind of like, you know, laid back and, you know, it's no problem for them if everyone's getting along because everyone's going to get fed. So it has to do with them not having as much competition and having a lot more abundance in their natural environment? Well, basically it breaks down to the female. So in chimpanzee females, the most important thing for a chimpanzee female is it has to get enough food to support its offspring. And so when the chimpanzee females, they actually, they, they separate. So they don't kind of, they're not like girlfriends. It's not like sex in the city. They're not like hanging out together. They're actually quite separate. Um, it's kind of like Gossip Girls. You know, they're all fragmented. They're just, you know, 
or backstabbing each other all the time. And so because of that, then the males can get access to the females. So if a male chimpanzee has a big bunch of fruit, then he can also, you know, guard that fruit and then allow access to, you know, certain females. He can overpower that females. He knows he's got something that the female wants. But with bonobo chimpanzees, with um, bonobo food, they're all just kind of like, you know, hanging out. The bonobo females can actually stick together because there's just so much food, which means that if a male decides to become aggressive and a bit of a bully, then the females all suddenly stick together. So there's very much sex in the city. It's like the girls against, you know, the rogue male, and they can very quickly put him in his place. We'll come back to that as well. That's another point I wanted to talk about. Um, so this brings us back to the what's interesting to you and Brian Hare about these primates, um, between them, the chimpanzees represent sort of our aggressive, warlike nature, and the bonobos represent the nurturing, sharing, loving half of us. And these, again, are our two closest genetic relatives. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that with the chimps because chimpanzees, they always, they have this really wonderful side to them. So chimpanzees are a lot like humans. They can, you know, they, they have love, they have empathy, they grieve when someone dies. I mean, politically, they can be really clever and they can defend each other and back each other up. But they do also have this dark side to them, just like humans. So um, in a chimpanzee group, there can be hunting. One chimpanzee group can sort of behave very much like a gang on the street of New York and they will go into enemy territory they will pick off a lone male from the other gang and then they will torture him to death so and it's quite horrible and, and there's they do, infanticide and, and there's infanticide and they beat cannibalism their, they beat their females they you know they like kill infants and so this is really shared a lot with human societies because also females aren't treated very well something like one in six women in America, and this is America where it's illegal, they experience domestic violence. If you go to a country like Congo where there's no justice system to protect the female, then it's much worse. And in um, the eastern area of Congo, something like 400,000 women, they think, have been raped. It could be more because, you know, how do you count this kind of thing during a war? So, um, so this is what they share, this is what chimpanzees share with us. So for the last 40 years, we've just been totally fascinated with that, like, you know, how cool is it that we've found our closest living relative and they have, you know, the light side and the dark side. But bonobos are just a whole different fascinating question because they don't have the dark side. And yet they're equally genetically related to chimpanzees and they're, you know, 98.7% of our DNA. So how is it that we have this ape that basically has very, very little violence. And that's what we're interested in, because whatever they've got, we need it, really. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we need it, like, right now, Good ASAP. Good call for gene therapy. Yeah, yes. a a ASAP. <laughs> um, you, you touched on some of the horrific things that people have done to one another in Congo, and there's quite a bit of that in the book. I don't want to delve into it too deeply, except to, to ask you about the people in your book, Claudine and the mamas. Tell us about Claudine, the woman who runs Lola. So she is absolutely amazing. She is a Belgian woman, but she's lived in Congo for over 50 years now. And um, actually, it might be close to 60. She might have lived there for 60 years. So essentially, she's Congolese, but she has this amazing red hair. And she was getting close to the age where people were retiring. You know, they were like, you know, people are thinking about moving to Florida or something. And she got this orphan bonobo, this tiny little bonobo, and she was sort of volunteering at the zoo at the time, the Kinshasa Zoo, and the director said, don't even bother, bonobos never survive. You know, we've had them come in. Once they see their mothers killed, it's just too traumatic for them. They just, you know, they just give up and they die. But she took this bonobo and, um, you know, and he, he did survive. And so when people heard this, then bonobos started making their way to her. And, I mean, you've met her. She just has this incredibly generous heart. And she just, that became the next phase of her life, was now caring for these orphans who are, you know, by the way, the most endangered great ape and, and sort of single-handedly just running the whole and the, the whole And show. amidst a very chaotic, dangerous place where oh, she was in the war. She couldn't leave. She couldn't invaded. leave. The, like, during the war, every single white person left the country. I mean, why would you stay? She couldn't leave. She had 12 baby bonobos in mm. her garage. Like, where was she going to go? The soldiers were, were coming in. They'd surrounded the city. They'd cut off the water, cut off the electricity. Her house had been looted. Like, they stripped everything. Like, even the copper wiring from the electrical service. Like, she had nothing. Her husband was hiding in the embassy, uh, and you know, could have been, it was just it was. But she she stayed. She didn't leave, and um, so she went through two wars like that. And yeah, she's just she's an incredible. She has this incredible spirit. Hmm. Um, and then tell us about the mamas who are. So the, <laughs> the mamas and I didn't initially get along because you know they got a bit of attitude. 
with our experiments. And so we went in there and I guess, well, I guess it was really our fault because we were going in there acting like we were doing it a favor, like we were doubling their salaries. And of course, you know, Brian, my husband, is just so excited about the experiments that he couldn't conceive of the fact that anyone would be less than enthusiastic to be running these things for like 10 hours a day. And of course, you know, I was affianced to him, so I was made to do it. But the mamas would kind of like come into our tests and they would like lie down on the floor and fall asleep. And, you know, we were trying so hard to make them excited and they would just, you know, give us this look. Like, can you just please leave me alone? And then it took a while to crack them. But once you finally, once I finally sat down with them and I go into the nursery every day because I love to play with the babies. And, um, you know, I, do, I just sit around with them and just really listen to their stories and who they are and what they've been through and the things they had survived in Congo as a Congolese and as a Congolese woman is just extraordinary. And so, you know, their spirit, I think is just one of the most precious things that I found I could write about. You, you have a beautiful picture, which I hope we can show, of Esperance. Uh, it's, I call it the Madonna shot. She's cuddling with this young bonobo. So, so what is their job? They nurse these babies back to health? Yeah, so just like the, um, the director of the zoo said, bonobos, they usually die. They lose their mothers. They can't handle it. They're severely psychologically traumatized. Um, you know, some of them have bits of their fingers and genitals and other body parts cut off and you know they just you, you can see them they just like hold themselves and they just rock like back and forth just like you would expect a child to do and so they have got no chance of survival you could give them the best medical the best veterinary care and they'll still just die so these mamas are basically the surrogate mothers so as soon as a baby bonobos arrive they're just plastered to the bosom of one of these mamas and that's where they stay until they feel well enough to um to get down and kind of like play with the other bonobos in the nursery group and when studies have been done they found that orphan apes this is really the best way for them to rehabilitate when they're raised sure. by their peers and you know they have these mamas with them. Uh, it's true of all of us primates the clinging need. You need you need yeah. your mother and some of them come in where they're like two years old so they're like tiny tiny they're, they're this big and they they can't survive without a mother they can't so these mamas are they and that's why they're called the mamas because you know they have you know all these crazy children running around. Uh, we do have a question in from the web now. Oh, um, Jack asks, uh, does it bother you when people snigger and make jokes about sex and bonobos? Do you, do you ever feel like they don't take you seriously as scientists? Well, I don't really take myself seriously as a scientist. Like, you know, I go in and I run my test and sometimes I have to pat someone's penis or their clitoris to, you know, make them feel okay. This is the bonobo handshake. This is why my book is called Bonobo Handshake because this is something that bonobos do to really ease the tension in their group. And I think that when people ask me about the sex in a kind of a sniggering way, I really see that as our immaturity as people because for bonobos it's not erot erotic at all. When you see them sort of like penis fencing or GG rubbing, which is when they, the two females rub their clitorises together until they orgasm, this is just, a, it's just so much more of a handshake to them. It's really not a big deal. So, you know, some of the stories are funny. I bet Jack is really glad he asked that question. <laughs> Yeah, everybody loves the lesbian sex. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's, it, it is a little discomforting. Uh, you mentioned this in the book that they rely so heavily on sexual touch for comfort and just to, how do you do? Yeah, uh, just like a, a hi. There's a hilarious passage in the book where you actually have to, you're, here, you're, here you are with your fiance, you're, you're thrust into having to do this research and oh my God, they're going to make me do this as well? Yeah, I know. Well, that wasn't really something that was in the brochure because, you know, <laughs> this was really driven by Brian and this is Brian's kind of projects and I was just kind of along for the ride. And then what happened was that, you know, he this was the, the first visit was just kind of like a recce visit. We were just there to try, sort of check it out. But we got there and it was so amazing and Brian was so excited that he wanted to start doing the experiments right away. So he had no students to assist him, like I was it. And so he was like, oh, honey, do you want to help me with some of these experiments? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. But the thing is that so um, I ended up doing most of it. And, you know, I can tell you why. But um, so I ended up doing actually almost everything. And the thing about bonobos is that when, they, when they're unsure about something or, you know, when they just want reassurance, they like my first bonobo was this little bonobo called Kakongo. And he was like five years old and he just stuck his penis out. And he would not do anything anything until I touched his penis. And, you know, how could I tell that this is what he wanted? I can get in the position for you, but basically he was holding the bars and there yeah, it was. And nothing it. was getting done. And like, I'm looking at Brian, like, what do I do? And he's like looking at me like, I don't even know. So eventually I just kind of like gave a little pat. And he immediately 
calm down. And he was fine. And the test we, went on. And I tried to recover. We have a photo of you that's that's family safe, uh, administering the the red porcupine test. Oh, that's that the red, show. red porcupine. So, so why is it that you ended up doing the protocols? Well, so the bonobos are a little bit wary of men. These This is a female dominated society. Like the females are in charge. And for some reason, or maybe it's because like the last thing many of them saw was like a, a man with a gun, that they're just not very sure of men. And so uh, they, I just ended up running everything because I was the one that, you know, could approach them, could like sort of do things without them completely, completely freaking out. Like after a couple of months, then Brian was, they, they were all fine with Brian. As long as he behaved like a proper, you know, we call them petite bonobo garçons, the little bonobo boys and maintain his distance. It was very respectful. Is, I had to wonder, is there anxiety about men from their childhood traumas or is it because of their matriarchal society? You know what, I think it's just matriarchal society. I think the fact that their mothers were all shot by men with guns did not help, but I think that bonobos have something really innate where they just, they seem to warm towards females a lot easier than men. So describe for us one of the other protocols that you've done. Okay, so our favourite one is the cooperation experiment and uh, it's very elegant. It was designed by the Japanese, but they could never get it to work because they didn't have enough apes, basically. So the, the apes, the, the chimpanzees that they had, they needed a lot of training, but because um, you know we had access to so many individuals, it was like a lot easier. So it's a long red plank and on either side you had like a pile of bananas. And through the plank there is threaded like a, an orange rope. And so each end of the rope had to be pulled by, um, by a bonobo and they had to pull together in a coordinated fashion to get the food to move, to get the plank to move forward so they can eat the food. So it was a cooperation experiment. They had to know that they needed someone else, they had to know that they had to do something together and they had to know that they couldn't do it on their own. And when chimps do this test, what happens? Well, chimps are fantastic at it. They are absolutely fantastic. They are the champions. Brian's student, um, Lithium List, did this on another sanctuary, Golden Gumbo Island, and they were like, amazing they cognitively they understood everything so you know they were letting in their partners because they knew when they needed someone and when they didn't they would you know they would judge their performance and if someone did a really bad job one time they would punish them by not choosing them the next time they would get someone else so cognitively they were amazing and they knew what they were doing but all you had to do for chimpanzee cooperation to completely fall apart was put the food in the middle because then instead of having two piles that one person could share again you have this situation with chimpanzees where if you put it in the middle there is one food pile and somebody can monopolize it yeah. so once you did that they it just completely fell apart but with bonobos because you know they live in this big chocolate factory they um they don't have any problem with that at all so you know it doesn't matter and and also they um the chimpanzees sometimes they had a problem with tolerance so if they didn't like someone, if they weren't somebody's friends, then they just, they wouldn't do it at all. Whereas bonobos, you know, you could put anyone together. You could put young ones, old ones, you know, same sex, different sex, and they all just pulled it. The, in fact, Brian had a recent paper in which it showed that the bonobos prefer to share. When they had every opportunity to monopolize the food, they yes. would actually first go and open the door and let yeah. their friend in. And this is high value food. It's not like porridge or something. This is like, you know, this is like the lint chocolate. We were giving them green apples and green they apples, love yes. green apples. And yeah, they would still, uh, you know, they had this pile of apples and other fruit in the room and they would still go over to a door, unlock the door and let another bonobo in to share the food, which is amazing. And, you know, probably part of the basis for, you know, some of the things that we see in our society, like, you know, donating to charity and giving blood, like this willingness that we have to do something for someone else at the cost to ourselves. This is, this is something incredible that you would never see in a chimpanzee. No way. No how. <laughs> <laughs> so just to recap, we're here with Vanessa Woods, who's a primate researcher at Duke University. And we are taking calls over the internet. If you're able, um, you can uh, put in a Twitter with the tag Duke Live, all one word. You can email us at, I got to, sorry, I have to struggle here, Duke, or live at duke.edu, excuse me. Or you can uh, post a comment on our Facebook page, please. So, Vanessa, you and your husband um, have both had firsthand experience with the aggression of chimpanzees. Yes. And and threat displays. And there's another passage in the book that I would like you to read in which uh, one of the bonobos tries his hand at a threat display and you um, <laughs> come away quite unimpressed with the whole deal. He's so funny. Okay, so there is a loud high-pitched whinny as a charging bonobo heads straight for me sliding on a small branch. When I was in the jungle in Uganda, I was once surrounded by a group of male chimpanzees. 
They crept up so silently that I didn't realise I was trapped until it was too late. At that moment, a chorus of blood-curdling cries filled the forest. They pounded the trees, their enormous hands echoing off the solid mahogany trunks. Branches broke like cracking thunder and shook like they were possessed by demons. Their screams went on and on until my hair stood on end and I was trembling. Through the leaves, I saw fierce, glinting eyes. I smelt something sharp and rotten. It was my own fear. This bonobo has nothing on them. He just charged me with a twig. He lifts his chin as though he's assessing the impact his display has had on me. Ooh, I tell him. Scary. He stares at me in dead seriousness. Claudine lowers her voice, anxious not to embarrass him. Tatango, she said, was recently corrected by the females. Corrected by the females. Corrected, that's what they say. They say well, when men behave out of hand, they get, they get corrected. So what happens? So Tatango had this problem where he, um, he thought he was a chimpanzee. Like he was big. He's the biggest bonobo at the sanctuary. He has these really big muscles, you know, he has the, kind of the big canine. And he knew that it was nature's law that he dominate females, basically half his size. And so he got to the stage where he was kind of, um, you know, just slapping some of the females around. And once I saw him do this to the alpha female, who's Mimi. Empress Mimi. We Empress have a picture of her. Empress Mimi. And so he went up to her in the night building. No, no reason. Just randomly. And just backhanded her across the face so hard that she got whiplash. Like, you know, her, her head just sort of whipped back and she just came back and she took it like a champion she just came back and she just looked at him and suddenly you could just see his face just go oh no <laughs> and within seconds and all this happened so fast but within seconds five unrelated females they called them the terrible five they went for Tatanga and they chased him all around the night building and he ran into the forest and didn't come back all night long and so this is really what happened a lot. And so Tatango kept pulling this stuff, right? And then eventually the Terrible Five, they were just like, no, we've had it. And they beat him up so badly that they pulled out one or two of his fingernails and almost ripped off his testicles. So after this, Tatango never made another problem. I can imagine <laughs> that, that got his attention. You yeah. can imagine that this would be seen. So this is what bonobos females do. It's not that there is no violence in bonobo society. There is violence, but the violence is very different than chimpanzee society. So and he asked for it. He was kind of asking for it. And uh, so chimpanzee violence, it is to maintain dominance and assert control, which is basically what it's like in humans as well. But bonobo violence is very much to keep the peace. So the females did this in order that there would again be peace and no big chimpanzee male in their group. So throughout the book and in the conversation we're having, you describe them as individual personalities. You name them by name and you discuss, they, say, they laugh, they smile. They're not human, but still they're characters in your book. It's really hard for me because like with a lot of these bonobos, we've seen them grow up. So, you know, we've seen them come in and, we've seen them, and you know, you work with them for so long that they have these kind of personalities. But, you know, I think Jane Goodall was ridiculed back in the 70s for like giving her chimpanzees names and, you know, I guess talking about them like they were people. And bonobos aren't people, but they're so like us in so many ways. And I think that you know, when we started this, these studies that we're doing, these cognition studies, it was all about what it is that makes humans special. And I get that all the time, you know. Well, you're looking for what it is that makes humans unique and, you know, make, which makes us so, you know, what is it that makes us so awesome? But I think actually it's the other way around. And we have just got the most important thing of all to learn from bonobos, and that is how to coexist peacefully. And, you know, for all our intelligence, we still haven't been able to figure this out. Why? Why is it so... No, they're not people. They're better than people. <laughs> Bonobos are going to save the planet. I'm telling you. You heard it here first. <laughs> so, so what are some of the big questions that you're going at now? If it's not about figuring out why we're special, what is it you're measuring now? Well, we're still trying to figure out what it is that makes us special because it's a really big question. That's where the funding is. That's right? where the funding is, right. yeah. As soon as we answer it, we're all going to lose our jobs. So we're trying to spin it out as long as possible. We are comparing the psychology of bonobos to the psychology of chimpanzees and then comparing them to people to find out where it is we differ because as humans we are amazing i mean we go to the moon we're here in this amazing studio you have this laptop and so we've come so far in so many ways so how did we get that way like what was the 
the first change that led to all the other changes. And, and people have been fighting about this for so long. It's like, you know, is it language? Is it the fact that we imitate? Did we start cooking? And then, you know, cooking led to bigger brains and then all of a sudden here we are. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out what it is about humans that is special and unique. And as a tool, uh, we're about to see the bonobo genome. It's expected out later this year, right? That's so excitement. Nobody knows exactly when it's coming out, but the bonobo genome, it's just, it's going to be such big news. And actually, um, so it's going to be based on the bonobos at the sanctuary that we worked at, Lola Yar Bonobo. That's, you know, how they, how they got it together. And yeah, it's, it's going to be fantastic because they had the chimpanzee genome and they had the human genome. And nobody was going to do the bonobo genome because there's just this kind of attitude that goes around like, oh, bonobos, they aren't really interesting and they aren't important. Like, we already have the chimpanzee genome. What, why, why would you need the bonobo genome? But bonobos and chimpanzees are in a lot of ways more similar to us than they are to each other. So, for instance, chimpanzees use tools, humans use tools, bonobos don't use tools. But then bonobos are wary of um, new objects and human children are new wary of new objects. But bonobo, I mean, but chimpanzee infants, like, you know, they'll go and rip apart anything. So, you know, the chimpanzee genome and the human genome, they differ by hundreds of thousands of nucleotides. So trying to figure out what's unique about humans, I mean, those poor geneticists, they're going to be, they're going to be in the lab for a lot of late nights. Yeah. But if you have the bonobo genome, which is, you know, only differs from the chimpanzee genome for by, you know, a couple thousand nucleotides, then you've got something, right? Then you've got a puzzle, you can find out where those two are different, and then you can then try and look for the same kind of nucleotides in humans, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a nice email question from oh, Maura. Maura asks, how do you start studying, how did you start studying this? Did you always know you wanted to be a scientist and a journalist writing about science? No, I really had no idea. And um, sometimes I just envy my husband, Brian, because he was like a laser beam from the first minute, you know, he popped out of his mum and he's like, this is what I'm going to do. I was like, just typical running around, doing different stuff. I studied chimpanzees in Uganda for a while and then, you know, I ran around and did some crevice zebra in Ethiopia. I was always just kind of looking for the next interesting thing. I mean, I wasn't really serious about anything. Like I did all this um, scientific research, but then I like I never published anything. And then I did all this writing, but I never really got serious about it until bonobos. And bonobos just totally rocked my world. I mean, I'm just like, oh my gosh, here is this ape and they they just they completely blew my mind and they're really cute I love to hug them so this became my kind of mission so I, I think that you know for all those people running around not quite sure what they're going to do you're going to find something and when something just really captures I guess when it captures your heart then you just you go for that and you follow that because that's where you're going to be happy so as part of your mission you write quite a bit you blog about Bonobos, yes. uh, bonobohandshake.com, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's an interesting thing. You you study these animals, but you're also very dedicated to their conservation. Yes, so um, I actually bonobohandshake.com. I just shut that down. Now it's Psychology Today. Um, I blog oh, for them on a on a new blog called Your Inner Bonobo, and that's just kind of looking at what what it is that we can learn from bonobo psychology and cognition, and what parts of bonobos are also the parts of ourselves, and what parts of bonobos are better than we are. And I, um, I'm also on the board of directors of Friends of Bonobos, which means I just do all I can to help sort of spread awareness about bonobos in the United States where, you know, they're not very well, well known. And um, also just to help the sanctuary. We're all volunteers, so they need all the help so they can get. So that's friendsofbonobos.org. Friendsofbonobos.org. Yeah, proud. thanks, Carl. You're awesome. Yep. And your inner bonobo for Your people inner who bonobo on psychology today. Okay, good. Um, you're a prolific blogger. You post almost every day. Yeah, I try to. I try to. It's not hard to write about bonobos. How do you, I've wondered though, how do you stay in touch with Lola? Because that's where the pictures come from, right? Do you... Yes. Well, we go every year. And yeah. um, so I usually get a whole bunch of material while I'm there to bring back. So if I've got kind of a generic bonobo post that just needs a photo, I can use one of those. But I mean, you know, Congo is hooked up. They've got the internet over there. I get, um, I get photos all the time from the release site, which is the world's first bonobo release. They just um, put some bonobos back into the wild in June last year. So they keep sending me photos and stories and stuff like that, and I can just, you know, put them on the blog. That's a, uh, I meant to ask about that. Let's talk about the release. The, yep. So the animals have been rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. they, do they reproduce at Lola? Yes, they do because bonobos are so rare and because um, bonobo mothers and their infants are such a core part of any bonobo group, then 
you know, Claudine, Claudine let them have their babies and then, you know, they moved this socially stable group into the forest and she released them. And I mean, it's, it's just been amazing because it's not like a chimpanzee release where, you know, a third of the males end up dead because other male chimpanzees, wild chimpanzees, like, you know, come in and kill them. So it's not like that at all. And so far they're, they're, they're fine and they, I think it's something like 40,000 40, acres or something. It's an area three times the size of Manhattan. So this is like a really huge forest. And, and how many animals did they put in? Nine. Nine, wow. including a Bonobo female and her baby who is growing big. And they just had two births there, which is amazing. But we think they were pregnant from Lola. So we're still waiting for the first, you know, wild-born Bonobo baby. But they've got a really nice group up there That's now. That's a lovely thought. And yeah. how are they being protected? Do the people around it know that it's a sanctuary? Yes. Yeah, so before anything happened, um, Claudine went and made sure she got the support of the local community because you can't run a release site in somewhere like Congo where they, you know, hump bonobos if you don't really have the support and agreement from the local community that this is what's going to happen. And so the Po, um, which is the name of the local people, they don't hunt, they're mainly fishermen. And so it was kind of easy to uh, cut a deal with them where, you know, there was, um, there was some medical benefits. Um, they, Lola brought some equipment for the birthing centres and also for their education. Like, you know, they built some schools, they were stocking some schools. So it was kind of an exchange where if the Po protected bonobos, then, um, you know, then all these benefits would then arrive in the community and this is going to be a long-term project it's not kind of like a dump and, and run thing yeah. I mean the bonobo for as long as the bonobos are there then the Po is going to be benefiting from from this so who owns that 40,000 acre reserve the Po they the, own it. the they local own. community yep and then they they signed it over and it's really nice actually because they're very poor they're extremely poor like their kids don't have clothes like there's malnutrition up there and um, someone painted on the on the building in the market that um, we protect bonobos and bonobos will save us. So I mm. just thought that's really sweet. That's a good nice lesson. Story. Yes. Um, and there are some graduate students on the ground, Harvard students and Duke students who are watching yeah. the reintroduction. And Yes, we had uh, Catherine Workman, who is from Duke. She went up to the release site and spent a couple of months there. And, um, and we work closely with the, um, with the release team and we're looking at like maybe sending some more students up there. But most of uh, the Duke students and the Harvard students are actually running um, experiments at the sanctuary. So interacting with the orphans because for cognition it's, it's, the, it's the easiest place to do it. You'll be happy to hear we're a bit uh, beyond 200 viewers right now. And, oh, fun. And we'd love to hear from the viewers. Yeah, um, call us. Uh, well, email. Email. Or, or uh, tweet. Um, you, uh, you actually met Brian doing chimpanzee research. He started out as a chimpanzee guy. Yeah. Um, and you met looking at chimpanzees and t what kind of work was he doing there? It was obviously a different line of inquiry. He was doing the cooperation experiments basically with chimpanzees. So the ones I told you about where the chimpanzees were just these amazing cooperators and they were showing these really human-like abilities. So, um... Everyone was kind of hypothesizing that chimpanzees had this, you know, e extraordinary ability to cooperate. Like they'd seen them hunt monkeys and it looked like they were talking and communicating, coordinating. But it's really hard to assess what an animal is thinking just by looking at them. It's trying to like, trying to figure out a kid's IQ by watching them run around a playground. Theory, this is theory of mind is what it's called? Um, is no, this else? is just, this is something different. So this was the cooperation thing. Mm -hmm. So um, you really need to kind of do an experiment with an animal so you can control for certain conditions to really find out what it is they're thinking because you can rule out sort of almost everything. And yeah, so he was just setting that up in Ngamba. He was really excited to be working at a sanctuary because a lot of these cognition studies, they're done in biomedical facilities. Yeah. And Brian's idea was that, you know, we don't have to do them there. I mean, it's better if we work in sanctuaries because, you know, the chimpanzees, they have a much better life. And in Ngamba Island, it's just like Lola. They've got a huge forest that they spend all day in and then they just come into the buildings at night. So, you know, it's just... For, for the that kind of work we do, it's just not necessary. Well, do we know that bonobos behave like this in the wild? Behave like what? Like they do at Lola. Oh, yeah. Well, they just came in from the wild. So um, they just came in from the wild and they're in a huge forest. And it's not like kind of 
Um, I know Franz Waal got kind of a lot of flack for his, when he saw the bonobos having all this sex in the San Diego Zoo, people were like, oh, they're probably just zoo animals. But when you put them in somewhere like Lola and they have this, you know, 75 acre of forest and that's where they live all day, I mean, you know, it's kind They of, do the same thing. They <laughs> look exactly the same. So, so we, have a, we have a fascinating question from Mandy on Twitter, which it hadn't occurred to me, but I love this question. What happens when a bonobo and a chimpanzee interact with one another? Oh, it doesn't come out well for the bonobo. So there was this uh, bonobo called Tembo who was in a bar and he was in a cage in a bar with a chimpanzee. And basically that chimpanzee would just beat the crap out of him every single day. And he was just a wreck by the time he came to Lola. Like they taught him to smoke, not the chimpanzee, but, you know, people would give Tembo cigarettes. And then, you know, he would just be violently beaten by this chimpanzee in a cage. So it's not, doesn't, doesn't go too well. The, I think I heard this story um, where they, I think Sue Savage Rumba had a group of bonobos and a group of chimpanzees and basically the male chimpanzees would only mate with the female chimpanzees when they were in full estrus, so when they were, you know, really receptive. But the bonobo males were trying to mate with the chimpanzee females all the time. So that's also what can happen. Um, <laughs> I think it depends, you know, how they're feeling. And whether it's just one male and one male in a, in a cage or whether it's, you know, something a bit more social. Um, let's talk about a couple more of the individual personalities. You've re referred to some of your favorites. Um, for example, the females generally didn't like Brian, but there was one notable exception. Oh, Malu. Yeah, so anyway, um, there was this bonobo female. And there's this funny thing that bonobos do. I mean, I've played with, like, dozens of infant chimpanzees and... They just kind of seem to like everyone the same. Like as long as you're going to play with them and kind of like roughhouse with them, they, they, I mean, they don't they don't really mind. Whoever comes in, they're like really happy to see you and interact with you. But nobody's really choose you. Like they decide that you're it. You're going to be their person. And so that happened with this little wench in the nursery called Malu. And so Brian just walked up there one day, and that was it. She was just in love with him it was a little sickening and he would um you know he would do the he would like helicopter her and he would like she would jump on his head and like hug him and he would kiss her and it was just gross and as soon as she found out that I was Brian's woman she started and she never had a problem with me before but she just started to beat me up basically I mean she would climb on my shoulders and she would bungee jump off my hair um, so she would hold my hair and then she would like jump to the ground and it really hurt and she would kick me in the head and do all this kind of stuff and yeah, this was, um, this was Brian's girlfriend and, um, I was so annoyed with her, but, um, she had this just amazing story. So she was the bonobo that got caught in the Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris. So someone had killed her mother, she made it sold that far. her. Yeah, I know. They had stuffed her in a bag, just, just barely. So they'd stuffed her in a bag and then this, um, this airport official who was watching the baggage come through, he saw through the x-ray machine what looked like a small child. And so he undid the bag and there was Malou oh. just completely dehydrated. She was almost dead. And they wanted to keep her. They wanted to keep her. The Parisians wanted to keep her and put her in the zoo because bonobos are just such a rare exhibit. And so Claudine immediately got on the phone to someone who got on the phone to Jacques Chirac, basically. And he's like, you put that bonobo back on the plane and send her back to Congo where she belongs. So... Um, yeah, she was she was a really really special bonobo, and you know I, she drove me nuts. But uh, when she died, it was it was horrible. Uh, and, and how did she die? She um, bonobos are kind of fragile. I mean, I think we see a higher mortality rate than we do in chimpanzees, and, and we don't we don't really know why. There's it could be a whole bunch of reasons, but uh, she just died really suddenly one day. It could have been a virus, and that was that was that was a tough day. Not bad. A um, couple more interesting questions coming in over the transom here. Uh, Jillian asks via email, what does the word bonobo mean and how are they treated by the locals? So bonobo, there's like this whole different, they, everyone's, there's a, a few different theories hanging around of how bonobos got their name. One was that um, it was actually a mistake and there was this bonobo in a box and there is this town in Congo called Bolobo. Yeah. And so somebody had like misspelt it and it was like bonobo and that's, that's how they got their name. So I think that's a dominant theory hanging around. And what was the other part of it? How question? are they treated by the locals, which we have touched on so, not well. Yeah, um, there's this kind of dichotomy, I guess, because they look so close to the humans that bonobos are actually really part of Congolese folklore. Um, 
there is this story where this mama was going to the nursery and um, sorry, she was going to the, a wedding and she had this goat and this leopard came and he was going to steal her goat and she was like screaming for help and then these bonobos came down from the trees and they acted like people so they, you know, chased the leopard away and there was this another story where um, this man actually took a bonobo female for his wife and he just came home one day to his village and there she was cooking for him. And so he married her and um, I don't know if they had children in the story. But um, so, you know, they just look so similar to people that they really are part of their mythology. But the thing about the Congolese is they are so poor. They are so poor. They are starving. And I used to be so angry at these hunters when these little orphans would arrive in just completely emaciated and with bits of themselves cut off and you know I was just raging about this one day oh you know these terrible hunters and the cook actually said to me he's like you know when I was 19 in my village we we saw this herd of elephant and they used to come to our village all the time and one day the these soldiers were there and there were you know 30 elephants and they killed them all and we were, you know, the mothers, the babies, all the elephants, they just shot them. And we were all so happy because we hadn't eaten meat in so long. We had no soap to wash our pants. We had no sugar. We had nothing. And then he just looked at me and he was like, you know, for a little soap and for sugar, you would kill a bonobo too. I was just like, oh, I guess I, guess I would. And, you know, we don't, when, when you're thinking about conservation, we forget what it, well, we just don't know. We just don't know what it would be like to be that poor and that hungry. So it's a very complicated question. Yes. Uh, another really interesting question uh, via Twitter from Camille. Do the bonobo males take part in the parenting? Uh, by take part. Um, so the relationship, the most important relationship with a baby bonobo is with its mother. But baby bonobos are kind of like, I, I say that it's a female dominated society, but actually kind of the babies are dominant because <laughs> if they want anything, like, you know, there's this little girl, Alikia, and, um, and she wanted like a peanut who was in front of the alpha male, which was Tatanga, who was probably her father. And so she went for the peanut and then Tatanga looked like he was going to do something about it. And then he looked at Semendwa, who was her mother, and she just gave him this look like, you don't even try it. And then he kind of like ran away. So in terms of like how, how involved are they as fathers, they play with the babies a lot. The babies can do anything they want. And this is not true of chimpanzee society. So infant chimpanzees, I mean, they play with the males, but they, they're always, always, there's always a line and they have to be very careful. Um, a, a, a baby chimpanzee, you know, an infant chimpanzee would never, ever, ever take food from a dominant male that just it wouldn't just doesn't dare. no it wouldn't dare but with smacked. bonobos they can just like do whatever they like so you know they'll climb over the males and they like they'll pull on their hair and they'll play with them they can get anything they want but really the most important relationship is with their mother we have a beautiful picture of Semendo I hope we can put up I call it the Venus of the Congo I know she is she's beautiful those breasts and her red <laughs> lips I can say that word <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, anatomical that's quite all right so if the males are subservient, or second class anyway, do they have their own pecking order? Is there a male who is more dominant than the other? Yes, there is. There, absolutely. So the biggest males are usually the strongest, but um, bonobos are like mama's boys, so they don't usually leave their group. So they really are, you know, they're, they're protected by their mother. So what we see in the sanctuary is sometimes a little bit different because uh, all their mothers have been killed. So what we see is, is real isolation between the males. They don't like to sit together. They don't hang out together. And, you know, if they get beaten up by the females, they get beaten up by the females. And in the wild, um, I've been told that the bonobo males, they do form friendships. And, of course, you know, if they, they can be protected by their mothers, but they need their mamas there. Otherwise, they get beaten up in the schoolyard. <laughs> that little sissies. <laughs> so who is the dominant male? Uh, Tatango was the dominant male, but he died. Sadly, I was, that was really that was that was also a bad day. Um, so he died at the moment. I guess Monono, who's the next biggest, it's just the biggest male. Whoever's the biggest, whoever's oldest, he tends to be hmm. the dominant one. So, um, you know, Jane Goodall's study of of the chimps was about their social structure as much as it was about the individuals. Mm -hmm. I, but I don't sense that you 
you've done much of that social structure study, you're mostly interested in the behavioral tests? Yeah, we're, we're mostly interested in their cognition. So the Japanese who work at the, this field site called Womba, and that is the best field site in the world. I mean, they've just had so much exposure. They've been there since the 70s. They're the ones who do um, the behavioral ecology and all the, the sort of the Jane Goodall stuff. And also there's another group, Godfrey Homan Group in, um, in Leipzig, and they also study wild bonobos. So what we're really interested in is their cognition, like how it is their they like how how they think and how their psychology is different and similar to our psychology. If you can give us an example of an experiment where they would ace it and we would fail. Okay, there... so there was this Windows task which I kept failing. I thought so dumb, but um, so it's it's a two windows and there's a banana on the ledge of one window and if you tried to push through, the banana would fall off. So you had to figure out that you had to reach around to get from the other window from the other window the second window and once I knew how to do it it was really easy but I failed it and also Richard Wrangham who is a very very super smart Harvard Brian's professor. mentor at Harvard. yes he's yeah. his advisor at Harvard he also found it the first time so then I felt a little bit better <laughs> so you put that test in front of a monoma or a chimp and they do it right yeah, the first time yeah there was this bonobo called Benny he was amazing he got all 10 trials right Every single one, because then you you switch the window and like you know, so it's a little bit different, and just every single every single time, you huh. just got it. Ten out of ten. That's Amazing. fascinating. Yeah, that's fascinating. So um, tell us a bit more about the sharing paper that came out, because I thought it was very interesting that the contrast between uh, chimps and bonobos sharing food with, uh, well, and and begging, the particularly the young kids begging. You just alluded to the fact that a young chimp would never beg from an adult. Yeah, well, they might beg, but they're not going to get anything, and they certainly wouldn't try and take anything. And they're likely to get cuffed. Yeah, yeah. For even trying. Yeah, yeah. So the, the sharing experiment that was really, really cool that came out um, that came out just in February, actually, and we sort of did something with chimpanzees, or, or you know, Brian's student Lethe and Lisland, they were on Ngamba Island. They showed that chimpanzees wouldn't share if they didn't have to. So if they could monopolize the food and the other chimpanzee couldn't get in, like no way were they going to give any were they going to give away any of it. And so Brian um, and our Congolese student, Suzy Quatenda, they did this study where um, as I said, you've got the pile of food and you can let in another bonobo and they could, you know, share the food with them, basically. And it's just I mean, it's just astounding as humans as all these economists who say altruism and Brian would really freak out if he heard that I was calling it altruism because it's food sharing. But, you know, basically you're letting in another individual and giving something to them at a cost to yourself. And that is sort of when you hear about these heroic acts. Did you see that um, on, I think it was CBS, where the male parachuter instructor, he had this woman with him. They were doing a tandem jump and the shoot failed. And so he flipped. So he was underneath her and took the fall. Hmm. Basically, and then so she fell on top of him, so she survived, and he is like now a massive paraplegic. I mean, stuff like that. It doesn't make any kind of evolutionary sense because Darwin's whole thing is that you do whatever it takes to pass on your genes. So when you're doing something like amazingly heroic like that, that's what people were saying made us humans that we would occasionally sacrifice ourselves for someone else that has absolutely no relation to us. And when they tried to find this in any kind of animal, um, you know, researchers just couldn't find it because if you look at bees who die to protect the hive or all those bees in the hive are sisters, so they're essentially still passing on their genetic material. And things like, you know, vampire bats who give blood to, like, hungry cave mates, well, that's kind of more reciprocal altruism because, um, you know, they do that in the hope that if they go hungry, then someone will give them to them. But something like that parachute instructor, I mean, you know, how do you ever... I mean, how is that ever going to be reciprocal? So the food sharing experiment was just really exciting because here was a bonobo who had food. He didn't have to give any of his food away, who essentially, you know, went out of his way, opened the door, and then gave up some of their food to share with this other individual. So it was just really exciting to see that, just the potential for altruism in another animal. We, we, we really should figure this out. Yeah, yeah, get working on that, someone. <laughs> so if, 
if Brian had a girlfriend, basically, did did you ever have a boyfriend among the Bonobos? Oh Bonobos? yeah, I had a Lebo. He's on the he's on the cover of my book. Um, he was like kind of like Patrick Swayze and Jody Dancing. Like, he was like <laughs> he was so tough, and he didn't really want to show that he wanted to be my boyfriend. And he would like come and he would like you know kick me and stuff. But when no one was looking, like when none of the other little boys were looking, he would like climb up on my lap and he would just like hug me. And if I ever touched anyone else, he would get rabidly jealous and then go and beat up that other little boy. <laughs> so I felt kind of bad. So yeah, he was my boyfriend for a summer. I loved him. So when the mamas have these intense relationships with the animals one on one, and they, at some point they have to like wean them and replace them with a new one, is there jealousy between their? No, oh, always. But they they're just like kids, so they grow up, and whoever yeah. is the smallest bonobo, they get they get the mama's attention but you know because they, they all kind of like sit around in this group in the nursery and if one of them gets up like as in gets up to leave like five bonobos that she took care of will just like flock to her and one will be hanging off her trousers and one will be like wrapped around her head and one would be too like wrapped around the arms and off she will go with all her baby bonobos and do whatever she needs they to must do. be very strong women oh <laughs> yeah you don't want to mess with these women i'll tell you <laughs> One of the, I can't remember the name, one of them you repeatedly describe as an Amazon. Oh, yes, Mama Yvonne. She is a strapping woman. She was also a <laughs> ballet dancer, so she has these, you know, incredibly long, graceful body, but her thighs are just so powerful. <laughs> and she's very, also very tall. So, yeah. We're uh, running close to end here. I just want to make sure we covered the book pretty well. We've talked about the bonobos. We've talked about the research. We've talked about Congo. I think we did everything. Well, good. Oh. Okay. This was a lot of fun. Thank oh, you. thank you so much for having thank me you. on yes. the show, Carl. Um, thank you for joining us on Office Hours. Uh, we've been talking with Vanessa Woods, who's a research scientist at Duke University. She's the author of a book coming out next week called Bonobo Handshake. And uh, you can follow her adventures at Your Inner Bonobo, on Psychology Today. On Psychology Today. Just she go just, to www.bonobohandshake.com. Actually, you can just there. Google Vanessa Woods and find <laughs> lots of things, not all of them safe for work because of the nature of her research. Uh, friendsofbonobos.org is the Lola Yabonobo uh, Sanctuary for supporting the animals in the Congo. A recording of this office hour session, along with many other Duke videos, can be found online in the Duke On Demand website. The URL is ondemand.duke.edu. Well, Vanessa, the, the students have finished their exams. The grades are turned in. Congratulations. Commencement is Sunday. Yes. So this marks the final uh, office hours for the year. We'll be back in the fall. Thank you very much for joining us on this and other office hours broadcasts. To learn more, go to duke.edu.